So tonight, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 25 to 29. Okay, let's just dive in and Paul, would you do the honours and read those verses for us? Sure. Uh, See that you refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven whose voice then shook the earth, but now have promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Through to what verse, sorry? Uh, 29, thanks. Okay. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore we we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Thank you very much. So that rounds off chapter 12, and this is <clears throat> typically referred to as a warning passage, one of the warning passages of Hebrews. But I'm not going to get uh, way late by debates about uh, whether you can lose your salvation or not tonight. I'm going to focus a little bit differently on this. Okay, and I just want to start out by saying, do you notice there's a charge here in verse 25? See that, see that you refuse not him that speaketh. Or as uh, one translation puts it, see to it that you don't refuse the one who is speaking. As we learned last week, the one who is speaking, uh, that is Jesus' blood. Jesus' blood speaks to us. Uh, How does it speak? Um, There are different ways we might put that, but I think in simple terms, surely the blood of Christ speaks the gospel, doesn't it? The gospel of uh, the mercy of God and the judgment of God. Um, We can look at how blood is associated with the gospel if we turn to the likes of Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. We sing it, don't we? There's power in the blood. Uh, But let's read about it. What does this blood actually do? How efficacious is the blood of Christ Jesus? Well, Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? There's power in the blood, isn't it? To purge your conscience. Wonderful. And I'm sure that has been our experience of times where we've been stricken in our conscience but we've come to the throne boldly and we've experienced the purifying the cleansing and we feel that God has reconciled us notice not we've reconciled ourselves to God and often I hear people say that that isn't true God has reconciled us it starts with him it's by grace that's not to say that there isn't a condition, of course, and that is that we come by faith. Hebrews 1 verse 7 is another example of the power of the blood. <coughs> and I remember when I first became a Christian, all this blood talk was just a little bit off-putting. Yeah? Yeah? Fountains of blood, and you think, oh goodness me, it conjures up some horrible imagery. Well, maybe that's because we don't quite understand what it's doing. Uh, and I, I think as time has gone on, I've appreciated that the <coughs> blood has a powerful effect to change us substantially. So Hebrew, uh, sorry, Ephesians 1 verse 7 says, in whom... We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. 
redemption through his blood. Redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redemption, what does that signify? Uh, releasing from captivity. Can't put it better than the um, Wesley, and I can't remember who else, there's two people who wrote this thing, isn't there? Uh, my chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth and followed thee. So, redeemed from captivity to sin and to death. And those chains are broken off. Okay, so we have a wonderful uh, gospel, don't we? It's good news. So no wonder the writer should then say in back to chapter 12 of Hebrews in verse 25 that we refuse him not and in the same verse a little later <coughs> that we don't turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. We have such a great a salvation, don't we? And so he says, don't refuse, don't turn away. If you want to drill down into the Greek, it is interesting that he uses firstly refuse, which is a little softer than the, the other word. It's like begging off or declining. Whereas turning away, the Greek suggests repudiating outright rejection so there's two ways of going about this you know the kind of slowly drifting off declining ah, it's too much this I don't need your Christianity and then there's the other where you just do an about face a vault face and reject the Son of God reject the faith but he says don't do that because look what happened to the Israelites. That was the context, that's the context of this, isn't it? We've been talking about the difference between Mount Sinai and Mount Zion and what happened to the Israelites. Well, they did uh, drift off, didn't they, and, uh, and, and reject. And there were bitter consequences as a result. But we are in a much more blessed situation having the new covenant Although that is not to say that we similarly can't do the same and drift or decline or outrightly reject what we know to be the truth. What we know as well and have experienced is good for us. And that doesn't mean it isn't difficult that it doesn't come at a cost. I've talked before about the way of the cross. Um, we'll touch on, a, on that a little bit later about the fire of God that purifies. But if we go through it and come out the other side, then we'll be so thankful because there is the eternal way of glory. Notice in verses 26 and 27 that there's also something that we escape. It says that we escape a shaking. Verse 26, halfway down, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also the heaven. And verse 27, once more, this is the word, yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Let's finish there. There's a whole lot of shaking going on. Oh dear. Oh dear. Well, what, what, what's going on here? What does it mean, this shaking? Well, this is a direct quote from Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. So let's test our minor prophet skills. First one there gets a club biscuit. 
Zeit zu. <lacht> Come on, guys. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth, and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Yeah. Now the backdrop to this is the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Remember, the temple had been destroyed in 587, 586 BC uh, by the Babylonians. It was sacked, destroyed, and thankfully, God turned his attention yet to Israel again, and they returned, the exiles returned, and the temple was rebuilt or should have been rebuilt before now but unfortunately the work um, had got delayed uh, it seems that the Jews weren't as focused as they should have been on getting the temple of God rebuilt okay but this shaking that had gone on had led to great upheaval and this destruction of the old of what appeared to be permanent, of what appeared to be everlasting, this great edifice, the temple of God. But thankfully, it was rebuilt. And similarly, scripture seems to indicate that in the future, there will be a great shaking too, with reference to the heavens and the earth. And some would interpret that as being an end of an age when Christ comes and we enter a new heavens and a new earth. Now, what you make of that um, is up to you in terms of your personal interpretation. Whether you consider that to be a future great shaking, as some understand from the likes of the book of Revelation. But whatever the case, whether you believe this shaking, this great upheaval is future or not, the fact is there will come a point when Vanity Fair will be over. Yeah? Vanity Fair will be over. It was over for the Jews, and thankfully uh, they were repatriated and the temple was uh, constructed again. And similarly, we uh, are pilgrims and we need to be careful that there aren't any old temples in our lives that need a good shaking, that don't require upheaval and frankly, a destruction. Vanity Fair in Pilgrim's Progress is referred to as an ancient thing of long standing. A couple of times it refers to it as an ancient thing of long standing. It appears to be permanent. It appears to be standing around for good. And then uh, the text reveals what Vanity Fair is made up of what it what is constituted vanity fair listing all manner of vain merchandise <coughs> such as houses lands titles delights of all sorts wives husbands children silver gold pearls i missed one or two out there but just some examples I think the ones I've missed out are deliberate. Why have I missed them out? Because the ones that have included are things that we might already possess now. 
You might have a house. You might have some silver. You may well have some pearls. You may well have a wife, a husband, or children. And yet, in Vanity Fair, these are the merchandise that are for sale. Well, they're not all bad, are they? They're not all vain, are they? Well, <laughs> let's look at John 21, verse 15, to try and answer this. Because we don't want to come away with some wacky idea that we can't have some of those things. And so we have to leave our children to fend for themselves or our wives or husbands and go off and live in the desert somewhere. 21 verse 15 So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. So do you see the point, the difference? It's a question of where your love is indeed where your heart is because where your heart is well that's where you treasure most isn't it or where your treasure is that's where your heart is and for <coughs> Simon ew, there might have been a tendency towards the fishing that was his great love Jesus says hang on a minute do you really love me more than these? So if we go back to Hebrews 12. What do we need to focus on? What do we need as Christians to really make our lives matter? If there's going to be an upheaval, and there surely will be, I think they call it the judgment, then where must your treasure be? Where must your heart be? Well, in verse 28, Wherefore, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. And there it is. That's where our treasure should be, where neither moth nor rust yeah, consumes, yeah, needs a way out. So verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. Now how do you feel about that, the consuming fire? In Corinthians it talks of the fire burning up the, the useless stuff that, you know, isn't making its way into the kingdom. That's what fire does. Sometimes we look at this word fire and just think, well, is that also all, all it's about? It's about God burning us up and hopefully we <coughs> won't extend his fire over us uh, because we're believers and unfortunately others might uh, be dispatched into that fire forever. Well, if you go finally to Isaiah 33, here's a slightly different take on it.
Remember, we're talking about what it's like to, to be in Zion. <coughs> well, in verse 14 of chapter 33, it says, for the, for the sinners in Zion, it says, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. Then it asks, who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Here's the answer. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly. He that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. So it may be a consuming fire to those who are sinners in Zion, but the fire can be something different to somebody who is walking righteously, speaking uprightly. And that's why, as I've said before, I sometimes have a slight inclination towards the more Eastern understanding of the consuming fire. Elsewhere in Isaiah, for example, chapter 10, it talks about the fire being a light for the Israelites, but a burning fire to their enemies. So, really, it all depends on you. It all depends on your receptivity. Are you walking righteously with God? Then you'll be fireproof and you'll experience that as the love of God. But if you don't, then I'm afraid it becomes something devouring. It becomes consuming. Throughout Isaiah there are other examples of this. Um, and it really is I think uh, uh, an explanation for the wrath of God that the wrath of God certainly is something that abides on sinners and something that we do, do not wish to experience but you know what on the flip side for those that keep God's commandments there is love and there is light and there is hope but be under no illusions that uh, we will fall into one or the other and that's where uh, I think the Bible argues that we must choose we must choose whether we will obey or not we must either be faithful or not. We must either trust and obey or not. Because God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense. Isaiah 35 verse 4. So we'll finish there.